At 2.28 p.m. on May 12, 2008, an earthquake registering 8 on the Richter scale struck the poor rural area of Wenchuan, Sichuan, China. Over 87,000 people were killed, including thousands of students who died when their schools collapsed. The massive human suffering led to an outpouring of disaster relief. Cisco, in the midst of a 16 billion US dollar long-term investment plan in China, committed an additional 45 million US dollars for earthquake relief. The aid converted the information technology of schools of the earthquake-stricken area from among the most backward in China into state-of-the-art 21st century information IT models and highlighted both the tremendous need in and the potential of the China market, a market that top management at Cisco was keen to pursue. To develop the China market, in the year following the earthquake, Cisco hired Ms. Aglia Kong. Ms. Kong was given the name Jiang Chaohui at birth and spent her early years in Huaxian County, Guangdong Province, China. At the age of 10, her family moved to Macau and following the Cantonese pronunciation of her name, she became Ms. Kong. She went to Canada for high school where she chose the name Aglia after the Greek goddess of beauty, glory and adornment. After graduating with an electronics engineering degree from the University of Minnesota in 1988, she worked as a software engineer patented several devices and started successfully and sold her own company. In May 2008, she was on a business trip for Symantec in Chengdu, Sichuan, China, when the Wenchuan earthquake struck 150 kilometers to the north. The next year, she joined Cisco to spearhead its Chinese enterprise networking operations. So when I uh, take a look in China, I mean, the first thing I realize is that, man, there were so much opportunities. Uh, how come we, Cisco, are not going after it? She analyzed the most attractive addressable markets, industries with large telecommunications expense management, or TEMS, designated for growth by the Chinese National Five-Year Plan, and mapped those addressable markets against Cisco's current and potential market shares. So education was being identified as the number one, and then healthcare, uh, energy, uh, uh, and manufacturing are the major four verticals uh, that I think we have a lot of uh, chance of successful uh, if we can deliver the white products and white architectures. Her approach differed fundamentally from that of Cisco in the past because Ms. Kong took a vertical, not a horizontal approach. She started from customer needs, not network technologies. She used the vertical approach on her first Cisco product for the China market, Sunbird. Sunbird is an in-classroom control device to link students' electronic backpacks with the education cloud. The vertical approach was a bigger cultural shock to Cisco than the China market itself. Technology in general goes cutting across all the sectors, right? So for example, if we create a switch uh, uh, for routing IP package around, whether you use that switch in a uh, bank or whether you use a switch in a, um, in a university, it's probably the same type of switch. The IP packaging function of that switch is still fine. However, that switch, the form factor itself, cannot be applied outdoor because it's not weatherproof, it's not ruggedized. The specific use case for it is uh, what is what I call it vertical. For example, supplying switches for internet access in the educational vertical in China differs from that in the West because of security requirements. They have to be able to pinpoint where the student gets online using what MAC address, what port number, what username, what uh, password, and um, then uh, how long. And so it's a seven parameter binding. Uh, in, but outside of China, all we care is that you know uh, your username and password and how long. The product will be different than a general purpose switch. So that's where the uh, vertical form factor will come in. The flow of data also differs from vertical to vertical, leading to different product requirements. 
between data centers and enterprises, the requirement to the product will be also different uh, because data center you're probably mostly using for high transaction and uh, web uh, applications which you know have very small packets but high data flow. But for enterprise it might be constant package but low density and that might also require to build different type of products. If we use a one size fits all vertical approach, then your product is not optimized. Shifting Cisco into a customer-centric vertical approach was like starting a revolution. Cisco is a leader in networking because they are the one created the network about 25 years ago and they are the one driving the network for all these years. They generalize the network. So for example, they push TCP IP as a standard because without that as a standard, network doesn't flow, right? The internet is really started by Cisco and Cisco is very used to being a leader in that space. In that case, what Cisco is doing is that I'm building a generalized products which can be used for all these verticals. And over 10, 20 years, uh, that type of approach work. Globally, three developments were increasingly undermining the effectiveness of the horizontal approach. The proliferation of new devices, the evolution of the cloud, and the new demands of the Internet of Things. There is more and more uh, devices getting on the network, and the characteristic of those devices are all different. Before, it's all a PC or server get on the network. Now it's your iPhones, iPads, and, uh, and you want to get on the network anywhere and everywhere. Cloud-based applications and cloud-based services are also driving a different type of demand. And the third thing is also calling for a change of the network design is IoT, Internet of Things. Because if you kind of think about Internet of Things, you want uh, to be able to connect all the information from all the sensors. These three factors, new devices, the cloud, and the Internet of Things were global. But the challenge of each factor was magnified in China. The number, uh, the number of devices per, uh, is probably double compared to the population because each people have two phones. And uh, so, so the mobility uh, challenge is pretty much in China already and people want to access the network from anywhere. China's technology is leapfrog because they just go from nothing to buying off the best. So then the second thing different in China is there is no uniform IT. Beijing and Shanghai, you probably have uh, the most advanced IT, but you can get out of the major cities that there is no internet, but people want to use the internet. The power source is not very stable. And, and also the power is not clean, actually. So a lot of the time that our product probably don't even work. Uh, when we do the testing, we're testing be, uh, based on, you know, very stable power sourcing. Uh, but in China, things just keep going up and down. So in that case, I probably need to design the switch differently to put a uh, huge capacitor in there to normalize the power fluctuation. China is the country that which really endorses IoT. Smart city is a very good example. Outside of China, I mean, in US or Europe, who will do that? Because it's already a developed city. Then you won't build a city from scratch. Mobility, the cloud, and the Internet of Things combined with the maturing of the Internet hardware market to present a clear challenge to Cisco, moving from a horizontal to a vertical approach. So it is an architecture selling, it is a solution selling, and also we need to work with the solution partners to uh, paint this end-to-end -end picture. That is actually the big, biggest challenge for Cisco because Cisco's um, Initial focus was mostly uh, we are selling hardware. We are a hardware uh, company, so we sell you the best of the best of switching. You know, we'll tell you exactly what our switch have, exactly what our router have, and but that got nothing to do with you know what you need to do.
Ms. Kong identified education as the most attractive vertical based on the commitment made in the Chinese 12th National Five-Year Economic Plan to push consistent content to China's 300 million students in 510,000 schools from kindergarten through grade 12 through an education cloud. Money was not an issue. China had reached its objective of spending 4% of its annual gross domestic product for a total of over 300 billion U.S. dollars per year on education. Whether it's a good school or in the city or a very remote school in uh, the villages, they all have similar type of challenges, which is that uh, there is no centralized way to obtain content. And then a uh, bunch of schools have to build up its own internal ITs. Uh, but, you know, the remote villages, they just don't have anybody who knows IT. The education vertical does not face an absolute lack of resources, so much as a difficulty to allocate those resources effectively. The Chinese government is investing a lot of money to try to bring the school up to date, but a lot of those equipments not being used because the teachers just don't know how to use it. Or once they got virus attack is our configuration, then they don't know how to use it. Ms. Kong's solution involves analyzing and addressing the pain points of the users, the Ministry of Education, the schools, the teachers, and the students. We have to build up an end-to-end -end platform that which we control the experience for the classroom and then connecting all the classrooms to a school server uh, and using the wire and wireless network. Then in this case, it creates a very centralized managed wire and wireless experience within the school with very fast network as an intranet. In the end-to-end -end solution, each school intranet needs to be connected to a national distributor of content for periodic updating. That would require education cloud, which centralizes your contents and the apps. Um, so, so building a white data center uh, to put those content and apps there is essential. And when a network is in place, then the school internet can join the, uh, the education cloud and then the contents and the apps will get streamed up and down automatically. The overall idea was not new. Cisco's implementation plan, however, was. A lot of company does either the cloud piece or the network piece or the, the classroom piece, but they don't look at it in an end-to-end -end way. The Sunbird, named after the 3,000-year-old mythical bird of Sichuan, would be a black box device designed by and manufactured under the direction of Cisco. Sunbird would be a classroom controller interfacing with an electronic whiteboard, camera, projector, and sound system, and the devices of the teachers and students, desktop computers, laptops, smartphones, and tablets. Student virtual backpacks would reside in the cloud. Sunbird would control access from each classroom in a local intranet. Through the internet, each teacher would receive updated curriculum materials and applications from the National Education Cloud. Rural areas often lack qualified teachers. Sunbird can help by linking classroom. So uh, using Sunbird, Cisco will be able to first attach to, you know, the K-12 uh, type of opportunities they were not used to be able to because they are missing the control point in the classroom. And then using the control point, we are also able to pull through a lot of networking and data center product opportunities. Implementing Sunbird would present many challenges. We think that there are multiple challenges. Uh, one is that Sunbird is really not a um, traditional Cisco product using the Cisco iOS. It's a new product. Uh, it, ha it is using Open Linux plus uh, uh, switching and uh, wireless capabilities which are not using Cisco's uh, uh, secret, uh, you know, internal OS. So in this case, um, Cisco really don't know what to do because we are creating a brand new product not using the traditional development. So that's kind of uh, one challenge. That challenge was an opportunity for Cisco to move away from traditional internal product development. 
For me, given that this product is not leveraging iOS, that means I can use a joint development model with outside vendors since I'm just using commodity uh, hardware. The opportunity was to develop the entire product in China. Usually Cisco developed first in the U.S. for the U.S. and then sold the product internationally. Cisco's process and uh, where the people's skill set are and probably how to drive this entire product life cycle process. Uh, since it's optimized for U.S., then if I do it in U.S., it will be much easier. But since I do it in China, then I don't know where to find those skill sets uh, because everyone might be, you know, uh, uh, English speaking and I cannot find a product manager in China, so I have to hire one. Uh, I cannot find a program manager in China, I have to hire one. So, yeah, so, um, so basically the infrastructure is not ready to do these type of products in China. Once produced, Sunbird would have to be sold, but Cisco did not have the appropriate sales force in place. Uh, we have to convince the customer that they are not just buying a box for the classroom. They are buying into a platform that which enable them to deliver education uh, cloud down the road. I don't think uh, uh, initially there is anybody from Cisco is helping me to drive the go to market. So essentially for the education vertical, I'm pretty much the one doing all the solution selling. So I have spent a lot of time, uh, you know, going to city after city, visiting different type of Ministry of Education from different provinces, and also talking to uh, the head of Ministry of Education uh, to convince him, you know, uh, why I'm pushing for this type of architecture. Sunbird will be a lot more successful uh, if we can get the customer to buy into the end-to-end -end, uh, architecture story. That end-to-end -end architectural story relies on the Chinese educational cloud. Unfortunately, the cloud to which Sunbird would connect does not yet exist. There is data center for the data archiving. Um, however, those contents are not you know, being put in a way can be accessed by all the schools or uh, all the uh, provincial governments. Uh, so, so as far as uh, pushing towards the, the the architecture I was describing is in this province. Uh, I mean, it's still in a proof of concept phase. But the Chinese education cloud is firmly rooted in government policy. So Ms. Kung is optimistic about the education vertical each region will start spending money according to that platform. This is part of the China 12 five-year plan, so they have to spend the money before the five-year is up.